Okay, we're here. Welcome back. It's Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntra is here, and uh, are, are you in Florida right now, Brent? I'm in Florida. There you go. He's usually on the run, but obviously even COVID will stop a Brad Meltzer dead in his tracks. I'm sorry. Not literally. Certainly not hoping dead in your tracks. It's great to it see you. It is Florida. I know, man. Jesus. Are you, like, wrapping yourself in uh, cellophane every time? You know like what? That? Florida is, like, two states, and the more north you go in Florida, the deeper south it gets, right? So our place is actually masks on, doing it right, doing it well. Um, but, you know, they've opened up everything. They said fill Dolphin Stadium. Well, thanks to the Miami Dolphins are run by people who realize, no, we're not filling the stadium full of people. So uh, but Florida, man. I know. What are you going to do? Well, I know we're in a, we're in a reasonable uh, state as well, Illinois. So we got a, we got a tough governor and a tough uh, mayor in Chicago and stuff. So we're trying to do it right. Well, let's move on. Two fascinating books right now, Brad, and, and two very different subjects to, to tackle with uh, the new IM books that you and Chris are putting out now. Um, let's talk about the complicated one first, which I would say is I Am Anne Frank. And, and I think it's a necessary discussion. It's, it's a, a definitely teachable lesson to explain to children, obviously, the, the, you know, some of the lousy things about uh, what happened during World War II. And, uh, you know, I know it's a subject that in generations past would likely be covered in church school. I mean, I went to Greek school for my religion. And a lot of times, along with learning the language, they would teach us things about Greek culture. Was that the case in Hebrew school? Was Anne Frank something that they would cover? You know, it's funny. I don't even think Hebrew school doesn't teach, at least my Hebrew school doesn't teach it, but I, I was a bad Hebrew school student, I will okay. tell you. But, um, you know, I think it's when you're Jewish, it's just you kind of know it. it. It's just like it's it's built into you somewhere. And I don't even I can't even tell you where I first heard the story. It's just one that I it's one of the few memories I don't even have a memory for. Like it just is. And I think. You know, listen, this is a book series where we are trying to give kids better heroes to look up to, you know, teach them compassion, teach them kindness, teach them character. And we did I'm Amelia Earhart, we did I'm Abraham Lincoln. But when I went into the editor's office and said, yeah, I want to do a book about the Holocaust and Anne Frank for kids, yeah. you know, I thought she was going to say, like, are you crazy? We can't do that. Um, and thankfully, she did the best thing of all. And she said, that sounds exactly what we need right now. And, um, and it obviously wasn't, you know, she didn't have to say that. It's hard to do a, a, a Holocaust, you know, a, a book for kids for the Holocaust. It's not exactly the subject matter that lends itself to it. So what are uh, some of the ways? The great thing is really the entire series, and we've talked about this, you, found, you find things that obviously kids can relate to. Is it uh, obviously her fascination with Hollywood, for instance? I mean, and, and celebrity, is that something that you... Yeah, I mean, you know, I, it's funny. Uh, Anne Frank is the, you know, is the only hero we've done who actually has no idea what she means to the world, right? Even Amelia Earhart, although she didn't, her goal was not to inspire millions of people, she's in the paper. She knows what she's doing. Sure. Everyone else knows what happened, um, but she's this kind of ellipsis. She's just like this dot, 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 and never finds out the end of the story. And... I think without question, one of the parts you said is is just humanizing her. We all know the story of like the girl who lives in the attic, but these heroes become these little cliches and, and we use the shorthand, you know? And I think for Anne Frank, it was just figuring out, she loved playing tag and running around. She loved going ice skating. And as you said, she, just, she was obsessed with like movies and memorizing the names of stars. And she like Rin Tin Tin the dog. And you do that, or, you know, her sister used to make fun of her big ears. Then my kids are like, oh, she's just like me. She's not some like Holocaust girl who, you know, dies horribly, but she's just like the rest of us, just trying to be a kid at one point. And things, you know, for, for obviously in her life go sideways. But I think, you know, that becomes the beginning of it. But I think the other part is just that realization that when we speak about Anne Frank, we, we say things, you know, we, we always treat her like she's cute. You know, the phrase you'll see is like, out of the mouths of babes come this wide. And, and I'm like, she she's not, you know, her, her wisdom about hope or her thoughts about hope are, are, that's not cute. She's right. She's not some dumb infantile girl who's like, you know, moody. she knows exactly what's happening. And she, despite it, 
finds hope. And that's a really good lesson. And, and I think for us, it was starting with that, but also starting just with the need in society. I mean, we are at a time where anti-Semitism is at, you know, in the last last year, the American Anti-Defamation League said it was had grown the highest growth it had in a single year in the 40 years it's been tracking anti-Semitic incidents. You layer on top of that the way that re other religions are targeted, Muslims are targeted, your skin color is targeted, you know, what you believe is targeted. This is, this is a recurring problem. So when we see that problem, Chris Aliopoulos and myself are like, how do you fight back against that? And that's where the book really comes from. The DNA of the book is, is it's never about, oh, we need to teach World War II, which is, you know, we should, and, and, or the Holocaust, which we need to. But it's also just trying to realize kids need this lesson today um, because they're seeing that same kind of venomous hatred running rampant. And this is exactly what happens when you let it do that. So the book is always going to be a way to fight back. Also, you know, obviously we know about Anne Frank because of her diary. Do you make the connection of kids blogging, kids, you know, I mean, that she was kind of almost doing, you know, the the Instagram or TikTok without without images of her day? In terms yeah, of I don't know. I mean, I, I don't, I feel like it'd be almost crazy for us to make that statement. But okay. kids, I think, will get that. I mean, we, we make it very clear. And Chris draws this beautiful image of her on the day she gets her diary. It's a birthday present. And she gets it because she wants to be a writer. She actually does want, amazingly, even at that young age, she wants that dream is to be a famous writer who has influence on people. Never sees it realized, of course, but that's exactly what happens. Um, but she does. She just is someone who, uh, like many of us, have had teachers who changed her life. She had a teacher who said, you, you know, you're know, you really good at this, who encouraged her. Uh, and she just was like, I want to put these down. She, I, did, I actually didn't know the story, and I've forgotten it because it is in Anne Frank's, it is in her actual diary, but she used to call her diary Kitty. Um, and she had a, you know, it was a name for it. She treated it like it was a person. So I don't think she was, it wasn't like, I can't say it was like TikTok or Instagram, but like yeah, she was she absolutely talking to this thing um, and putting her words out. And yeah. the thing that's amazing uh, when you see it is, again, is, the dream is exactly what happened. You know, it's, it's very few people who will be like, you know, well, my dream is to be a blank. And then you see 40 years later, they're the blank. That's just a rare thing under any situation, much less a kid who's grown up in the Holocaust. No, agreed. I've been to the house. It's been about 20 years since I went to the house in Amsterdam. And uh, it's amazing. And it's powerful. And yeah. And, and, you know, Chris did. We actually did... Um, we did the the cutaways, you know, I said, I want to do it, you know, do the full cutaways so you see the house. Right. What I, the, and, and we all know kind of the stories and the rumors of the house. Um, but one of the things that I loved is we did this wonderful, and, and again, full, you know, credit to comics for this is, uh, we wanted to make the space shrink. We wanted to, the book to actually feel different in this life. And so I said to Chris, it, almost like on the screens we're talking about is that one, you know, the, the book is told in these full page spreads and when she actually goes into the attic, I said, I want to shrink the space that she's in. Like, let's just truly like put black space above and black space below. And let's completely start shrinking as we're telling her story. So you can physically feel the space shrinking around her. And it's what the graphic medium lets us do better than anything. And, and it leads to one of my favorite spreads in the book is a spread where you can see her view from the attic. And Chris draws this beautiful view of like winter, spring, summer, and fall. And you see her looking out the window, this little window in her attic. And her only view is a chestnut tree. And so all she could see is this one chestnut tree. And she watches the leaves fall off in the winter, watches them come back, of course, in the spring. And the crazy part of the story is in 2010, that chestnut tree actually fell down, was knocked down. Oh, wow. But here's the best part of it, is that they took the saplings from the tree and they started planting it all over the world. And right now, there are trees all over the world that are proof that Anne Frank's more alive and her story is more alive than ever. And if that's not the best way to teach your kids hope, I don't know what is. Because right now, listen, let's be honest, our kids are anxious. We as a culture are anxious. It is look around, you know, whether it's the virus, whether it's politics, there's plenty to be worried and anxious about. And the only way, when you're sitting in darkness like that, the only way out is you must realize that in any darkness, you can always find some light. And that's what hope is, right? There's a line in the book that says, you know, hope is something that burns bright. You decide when to put that light on. 
And when you put it on, nothing gets to put it out. And I love the fact that, you know, the book is a nice story, but my God, for where the culture is right now, we need that lesson of hope more than ever. Agreed. During this period, have you had chances to talk to classes? I mean, obviously, again, you're a guy that's constantly on the road uh, talking, you know, doing book signings and stuff. Have you done any children's events since COVID began? Yeah, so we've done, um, we we are, the, this entire week is, uh, we are going to kick it off and we are doing all kids events, I think every single night this week through the weekend. And we're doing everything from like JCCs around the country Great. to the Walt Disney Museum invited us and wanted us to do stuff. Um, and to books and books in Florida to uh, politics and prose in Washington, D.C. They're beaming us all over so you can check our website. You'll see all the nonsense. But what, what I love is um, we got actually an hour, not even a half hour before we started talking, we got our first reaction from a reader who got an early copy. I don't even know how. And, and basically wrote to me and said, um, I have two kids. They're five and eight years old. I was ready for the eight-year-old to read I Am Am Frank, but I was worried about the five-year-old. Didn't know if they were ready for it. And I'm re reading this email. I'm like, oh, crap, here it goes. This is either it works or it doesn't work. Yeah. And they said um, that there's two sons uh, are, have been talking about it for now days, um, asking really good questions, asking about Anne Frank, worried about her, knowing about her family. Um, and just, you know, he said, I didn't think my kid was ready. My wife thought she was. And my wife, as always, was right. And I love that. I love the fact that that's out there. Brad, forgive me. I had my microphone weighed down. I hope you could hear me okay during yeah. that whole time. And was it loud enough? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Okay, good. Well, now it probably is better. And I'll apologize good. to everybody. But, uh, no, that's incredible. And I'm, uh, I'm glad you're doing this. And I'm glad that the response, because that was my concern, too, that maybe for the children it might be, you know, especially the small children and stuff. How, how well, listen, yeah, I'm going to go blind into it. I mean, we basically went to we went to the um, Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. and said, you got a good historian. We need someone to really check this for us. We went to the Anne Frank Center in, in Atlanta, said we'd love your help, too. I mean, we always bring in experts on every single book. We had, you know, we had Billie Jean King do Billie Jean King and Jane Goodall do Jane Goodall. But we had John Lewis do Dr. King for us. So we knew for this one, like this is, you know, you wow. don't want to mess this up. And yeah. You know, it's funny, John, we, you know, we get lots of reviews and, and I truly believe after all this time that just because you get a bad review doesn't mean you suck. And if you get a great review, it doesn't mean you're great. But in, in all 22 books of the kids books, Anne Frank is number 22 in the library that we built that we're building. And we never got what's called a starred review, like a fancy schmancy thing they call in the book publishing world from the trade press. So the trade press will dole out a very few starred reviews. And again, life goes on. It's okay. We don't ever get one. Um, but I Am Am Frank got our first ever starred review. And it said, this is the standout of the series. Um, Chris drew the crap out of it. You got to see what he did. And he just blew it away. Um, and obviously, it's silly. It's dumb. It, it's, you know, I, again, I don't think uh, reviews mean we're great. And I, 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 it's, I must repeat, it doesn't mean uh, that bad ones mean we're terrible. We get plenty of both. But this one did actually matter for me. I don't know if it's because I'm Jewish. I don't know if it's because it's Anne Frank. I, it just, but this was just something super extra personal in a way that I couldn't, I can't explain. That's outstanding, man. Honestly, and uh, I, I, I can't believe twenty-two books. That's amazing, man. I know. When we went in to sell the first ones, the publisher said, "Oh, great! You have Amelia Hart and I am Abraham Lincoln. Two books. You know, we'd be interested in buying two books." I said, "I don't want to sell you two books." And they said, "What are you talking about?" I said, "I want to sell you a hundred books." I said, I want to help you build a library of real heroes for your kids and your grandkids, your nieces, your nephews. And they were like, oh, oh that's cute, Brad. You're funny and you're full of yourself. Um, but, <laughs> but they just sent me, because Chris has actually now done the covers for the first 25, and they just sent me a little sheet with the first 25. And I'm like, I wrote back and I said, quarter way there. Um, so wow. we are going. It's pretty crazy to see. Uh, that's a lot of books. Yeah, that's amazing, man. I never heard you uh, say the number 100. That's fantastic. Um, Jesus, uh, that's, and again, you're a quarter of the way there. That's beautiful. Well, let's talk about the other one now. And that's of course, Ben Franklin. And I'm, you know, I love Ben Franklin. I loved reading those stories as a kid. And he really is like the media genius of his day. And again, I wonder if, uh, now there, now here's a more palatable way to say that Ben Franklin was the blogger 
of his day with his newspapers in Portland. Yeah, and the, and the Ben life. Franklin's a badass. He just is, and you know, <laughs> he just he, uh, you know, you take it on because you're like, it's Ben Franklin, and we all know him, and he is the famous one. And yes, you know, we do the lightning and the key and the whole bit and the kite. But again, that's never what gets me. I love that he invents bifocals because God knows, you know, anyone in middle age needs them, you know, like as you get older. Um, and, the you know, start subscription libraries, all things we love. But it was the it was the little stuff that always got to me. And, and you know, of course, when he's younger, he's such a – I mean, this is a little kid. He's such an inventor. He, um, he loves swimming. And so he's like, uh, you know, he realizes that if you have big hands, the bigger your hands are and the bigger your feet are, that the faster you'll move when you swim because you can push the water. And he's like, well, looks at his hands and is like, well, how do I make them bigger? And he makes these kind of like oven mitts, like these big giant mitts for himself and then almost like makeshift flippers for his feet and gets in the water and it's like, zoom. And I just love that. And he's like, you know, tie, he flies a kite by, by this lake and he like puts the kite in the air and then says, I wonder if that kite can pull me across the lake. This is again, as a, as a kid, puts the kite in the sky. The kid loves kites clearly. And, then while, when it's flying, jumps in the water, ties it around his waist, goes on his back, and lets it pull him slowly across the river. And I'm like, that's just awesome. I, I don't, you can say that the lightning is just icing on the cake, but sure. that is good stuff. But I think what, what struck me most about him is that Ben Franklin, for all the credit he gets for all the other inventions, the, the, the experiment that he's working on more than any other is the experiment of himself. He used to keep this kind of rules to live by, these rules of, of, you know, how to be a good person. He was like, number one is be frugal. Don't spend money you don't have. Number two is tell the truth. Three, work hard. Four, and again, think about that, this today. Stop uh, being mean to other people. Don't talk badly to other people. Think of where the world is right now. We need that message more than ever. And he, you know, Ben Franklin is one of the few people who, you know, anyone who says, I got all the answers or I know it all, that is the person that always knows the least, right? That is the, that is just a braggart. And Ben Franklin knew that the only way you change the world, I mean, right now we love to fight. We love to argue with the other side. It's almost like sport. But I love that Ben Franklin realizes that like the only way you're ever going to change the world is you got to start with yourself. And he realizes he's the experiment. He's constantly working himself throughout his life over and over trying to make himself a better man. And man, I need my sons and my daughter to hear that lesson too. That's beautiful, man. No, I'm a, I've always been a massive Franklin fan. I mean, he is. He's the most fun of the founding fathers. And even just the vegetables of history, the way they, the way they taught it to us maybe in, uh, in grade school and stuff, there was still, you couldn't help it. I mean, again, the man had such a dynamic life. That well, it's also, he's editing, yeah, he's, and he's editing the Declaration of Independence, you know? He's like, you know, <laughs> Thomas Jefferson's like, I'm going to go write it. I got it. I'm on me. And then he brings the Declaration back and gives it to, to Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin's like, let me make some edits here. I got some notes, you know? And he's like... And he writes, you know, the original draft said we hold these truths to be some, you know, self and and, and undeniable. Oh, and, that was and, Jefferson's original, right? Was undeniable. And Ben Franklin's like, no, 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 no. How about this? We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. And that's that edit, you know, Chris drew the actual, you'll see the, the declaration of the first draft in, in the book. But um, I love the fact that Ben Franklin's got notes. I mean, so whenever I get my editor coming back, I'm like, I can't bitch anymore, right? I mean, if, if, if Jefferson can take notes, I got to take some notes. And, um, and Franklin is, is, he's also awesome. And again, I think just for where the world is right now is, you know, he gives, uh, his brother runs a newspaper when he's yes. younger yep. and he wants to be, you know, he wants to be published and all of us who, who write for a living know that feeling or draw for a living. You know, you want to, you want to get your word out there, but he knows his brother's never going to use his stuff. He's never going to let his, his younger brother like get a shot. So he makes a fake name. I think it's like the Lord's do good. Like it's a horrible, like fake name. It's like fakey name, Mick, Mick fake namey. And, um, and he writes this letter as a woman and the brother's like, this is good stuff. We're, we're print, printing her letter. And then he eventually takes over an actual newspaper. Um, but what he does is he doesn't just run his ideas. He runs ideas from the other side as well. And it was very important, again, where the world is right now, to say, you know, if you're just showing one side, you're not informed. If you just read one, you know, if you consume one station or one side of politics, 
You're not an informed citizen. If you watch just MSNBC or just Fox or just CNN or just one thing only, your team, you're not informed. you got to see what the other side is thinking and doing. Um, and that's what is good. And it was important to me to have the idea that the free press is important. It shouldn't be crapped on. Um, it's there to keep those in power in check. And it's the reason we have that First Amendment. So I love the fact that, that Benjamin Franklin stands for that as well. That's cool, man. No, I'm excited about both books. Uh, oh, by the way, you know what we did? Oh, I got to show you. We did yeah, something really cool with it. So I'm gonna, you know what? I'm going to pull it off because I just forgot. I can show it here. I, this is the good part. Is So in the back of every book, you know, we always put like little cameos, and Chris always draws me as a cameo in there. But I can show you. <laughs> he does. But look what we put in this one. So I'll show you. So this, right? We did get. Uh, oh, that's just, great. We did get Marty McFly and Doc, unless you are from Back to the Future and a lawyer, in which case it's totally not them. That's just a guy in a bed. But here, here is for the comic fan in here. You got to see. I, this is a request by me. There's no other interview I will do where I could show this because no one will care. Um, but look, look at this. Oh, my God. That's Electro. And, and next Black one? Lightning. And Black Lightning. That's fantastic. Electro and Black Lightning in the book. I was like, we are putting it in here. It's going to be so good. So I love the fact. I just love the fact that, like, here we are doing, like, this, so, you know, the serious history. And I'm like, in the script, I'm like, also, oh, please put Electro and Black Lightning in their original costumes, of course. <laughs> I have no doubt. I don't remember Electro's civilian name, but I have no doubt Jeff Pearson and Electro are going back to the Franklin thing and paying their respects. Absolutely, yes, man. Yes, that That's is outstanding. Uh, not a question. <laughs> That's excellent. All right, now a serious question, because as a historian, I, I, I'm interested in your thoughts, because I believe, certainly, because of these current times, that we're hearing from different um, sections that they feel history needs to be recontextualized. Yeah, and, and retold. And, and as a historian, yeah, your thoughts on that? You know, listen. The, the the reality is, is two things can be true at the same time, right? Like, I I do not like when uh, history becomes politics. I think that's actually a very dangerous thing. Agreed. Um, that is just not good for anyone. Um, I also think that history is complex, and if you are just giving one side of history, you're doing a disservice. And what I, but again, I just don't like when you pull down statues because you're like that person, you know, did this. I mean, Benjamin Franklin and many of the founders owned slaves. Yes. Benjamin Franklin also, at the end of his life, spent time as the president of an organization to abolish slavery. Okay. Those two things are both true in the same person. So is Benjamin Franklin good? Is he bad? Or is he like the rest of us? He's complex. Right. And, and if you're looking for perfection, everyone fails. Right. I don't know what your religious beliefs are, but it's like if you want perfect, go to God and everyone else get in line. We all fail. Like we are all have moments where we're not our best self. And obviously there's lines in that. And, and, and you know, slavery and, and enslaving someone is, is a different story than having a bad day in your Starbucks. Of course. But but I do think that I was just reading about, um, you know, it's amazing that both the left and the right will point to the other and say, how dare they do this? And, um, and I think we're doing a bad job right now in talking to each other. You know, I take these books on Fox News and then I take them on CNN. I take them to NPR and I take them to Glenn Beck. I, you know, we literally, it's the one thing that America does agree on. They do like these heroes and they do like what they stand for. There's no politics about it. But the one thing that they both whisper in my ears when I'm in these green rooms or I'm in the little rooms, the waiting areas before we beam out, is the way we talk to each other as a culture is wrong right now. Um, we're doing it wrong. Wow. We're wow. doing it wrong. Even at, the, even at the most crazy of places that you think, they say we're doing it wrong. There's something wrong in America right now with the way we do this. And, and I firmly also believe that if you're just telling the old history and it's, you know, it, then you're also doing it wrong. I mean, there are, you have to talk about slavery I remember at one point, you know, there was a point where I, someone wrote to me a letter and said about I am Abraham Lincoln. They were like, you know, how dare you teach that the Civil War was about slavery? And I was like, are you kidding me? It was about slavery. That's what it was about. But this person had thoroughly convinced themselves that it was about whether it was, you know, you can call it economic issues, call it whatever you want. But I'm like, that's what slavery is. 
You can call it, that's what they mean by economic issues. People are mad because they weren't making money and they wanted to enslave others to make more money. That's right. what it's about. Yeah. Um, and if we can't agree on basic facts like that, we, we have a problem. Um, but I also believe, uh, I was just reading this opinion piece about, uh, it was really interesting, but about when reporters, right, who are always responsible for the first draft of history, try to take over the permanent draft of history. Ooh. And when that, and I was like, that's a really good idea. It's a really interesting question. It's like, can a reporter who's in real time be in charge of full time, um, or is full time just left to you know those of us who want that? And and I really do believe it should be left to the, those who have the time and the patience and the space, not three hundred words and a quick story that you can click on, um, but to offer context, to offer and say this is what else was happening. You can, you know, but but reducing people like Benjamin Franklin or anyone else to say good, bad, that's a good one, that's a bad one, you know, is, is uh, it's a path to nowhere. I don't think that's a good thing at all. And I, boy, it's funny because literally yesterday I always watch the media watchdog shows on all the networks to hear what everybody is saying, and I did hear pundits accusing reporters of uh, judging history rather than just giving that first draft and that's very interesting and and i wonder back to my original question um there's always been kind of con recontextualizing old history and and uh am i right i mean the evolution as we get more information a lot of what might have been you know uh considered accepted as this is the gospel truth about this historic person, then suddenly a new vein of, of information comes and things do get recontextualized. Sure, right? and they this have to. They have to because time shifts and so do our beliefs, right? I mean, there's a point in time where no one wants to hear about an enslaved person's version of history because it's back in those olden days where they don't care. And now we realize, wait a minute, you just got part of the picture. It needs that context. And if you don't do that, you're missing it. I mean, Go to the African American Museum in D.C. and tell me, tell me, I dare you, I challenge you to go there and not say this is an important part of history and it was silenced. It was yeah. silenced, truly, yeah. just not allowed. And, you know, I think I, I firmly believe that your greatest strength is always your greatest weakness. And I think as a culture, we used to get our information and our quote unquote daily news um, from basically three sources, right? It was the kind of the three big news stations. And yes, there were obviously a number of papers, but it was like, it came from the television on these three big networks, maybe four, uh, depending on what you had. Yeah. But what was fascinating is that's not a good thing. You know, everyone's like, oh, it was so much better because we could trust everyone. And it's like, you know, again, greatest strengths, greatest weakness. The, what we have right now is everyone's got a voice. Um, the bad part is there are no gatekeepers anymore. Um, and I don't mean that gatekeepers are good, but I mean, there is no filter whatsoever. Anyone who wants to say anything puts it out that we are all, yeah. there's a great, Sasha Baron Cohen wrote this beautiful piece in Time Magazine last week, um, that we are all conspiracy theorists. I think he's absolutely right because everyone now is an amateur detective and as someone who hosted, a, literally I, I hosted my own conspiracy theory show, but one of the things we tried to do on it um, is, is, I remember when we did the first episode, they said, you know, the, the, the Freemasons are out to get us and we're worried about them. They're taking over the world. And I was like, this is nonsense. I'm not saying these lines. This is, this is not right. And they said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to tell the truth. And the History Channel, to their credit, said to me, tell the truth. And so some episodes we had were, you know, were like, this is internet bullshit. Like, this is nonsense. This is like totally made up. And sometimes we were like, no, this is a problem. So the government did this and they shouldn't have done this and someone did this. And we tried to wade through, but when we, all of us now, I mean, look at, look at Trump getting out of the hospital, that thing, we, he, every movement was analyzed like the Zapruder film, as it should be, right? But all of us are suddenly experts on body language, on movement, on makeup, on his face, on his medicine, like, and the problem that it creates, although it's great and creates these wonderful things, because now we have everyone's voice, it also creates this thing where we can't find the truth anymore. It's right. near impossible to find it. And I don't know how you put it back in the bottle because the only way that things move around because of the algorithms of Twitter and Facebook, the more controversial it is, the more you're going to see it. Yeah. That's a terrible recipe. It's a great recipe for bombs. It's a terrible recipe for democracy. And as long as you let that happen, 
where the things that are wilder and more outlandish are the things that are going to get more play, we've got a problem. And I don't know how to fix it, um, you know, unless, you know, Zuckerberg and these guys get it together and realize, wait a minute, maybe we shouldn't put crap out there and let it just get viral that quick. So Agreed. to me, greatest strength, greatest weakness, but here we are. Isn't it ironic the information age is really the disinformation age? And it's, uh, yeah, I think all, the, all, all we wanted from the supercomputer in our pocket, which does still give us great information, just has to compete with a lot of shit and a lot of conspiracy. And listen, yeah. you, can't, you, you have the Library of Alexandria in your pocket every day, but the hardest thing to find is the truth. Right, you just don't. You put go put in anything. I mean, if you look up nine eleven, um, <laughs> and you go put in and go put in the Pentagon, you can't find footage of nine eleven on the Pentagon because there's so many wow. YouTube. Go on YouTube, try and put it in. You can't find the footage because there's so many conspiracy theory videos out there that say that the plane never crashed into the Pentagon. My friend was on that plane. She was a flight attendant on the plane. Don't tell me no one died there. She never came home. I know. I was at the funeral. Um, and But you can't find it anymore because it's been buried under people just putting up their crazy-ass videos saying, look at the swirl of the smoke. I can see a demon head in it. And it's like, it, you know, uh, that, that is what people want to see. And that seems more interesting than the news version. And here we are. Um, and now that I said demon head, I guarantee you you're now going, oh, I want to see what the demon head is. Because why? It sounds cooler than the friggin' boring truth. No, I, you know, uh, are you a Star Trek guy? I always forget. I am. I'm more Star Wars than Star Trek, but That's listen, right. Picard is my hairstyle, so well, I there, well, for it. <laughs> I don't know if you were a Deep Space Nine watcher. I like Deep Space Nine, but I'm more next gen. I, I whatever. That's the cool. Borg was always a good thing, and Picard was always my guy. Well, there was a there was a joke in the last episode of Lower Decks, the cartoon. Oh, and, you know, Noah it, has me watch. He wants me to watch it. I heard I got to see it. There's a there's a there's a crew member that says uh, hey wolf 359 didn't really happen and changelings are a myth so there's that they had a conspiracy right conspiracy. that's but that's what we are right now that's what we are <laughs> so yeah what are you gonna do jesus that's insane brad honestly. i'll tell wait, wait i gotta answer that question what are we gonna do we can't throw our hands yeah. up john i gotta well, say no, it like yeah, you please, know what when hey. you see that crazy ass thing on the internet that makes you laugh and it's kind of funny but don't pass it on don't forward that. Oh, God, don't yes. give it the like. Oh, like yeah, the you have to like fight that. the. Al I know it's silly, but I, I feel like we should all be wearing t-shirts say fight the algorithm. But you got to fight the algorithm. You have to stop passing along crap. And I know it's so tempting to be like, you see that thing that boils, makes you boil. Don't just hit forward until you verify it. And I will be guilty of it too. I remember, you know, forwarding something that I was like, this is a good source, this is a good thing. I won't forward anything on my social media until I can check it. And someone came back and said, did you see this? And I was like, crap. You know, like, and, but that's why you have editors and that's why that is the good part of a gatekeeper. Someone who says, don't put that out there until we verify. Um, I, so don't forward it. Don't just throw your hands up. Well, you know, I'm an old broadcast guy. Yeah. I was saying, you're always, the old broadcaster. So yeah, we have, we always have bosses that say, you can't do that or whatever, or before you go run with that, you better have five sources that agree with what you're saying. And listen, you know and I will say, you know. Again, I can't also say the only bad things happen. I mean, if you don't have this ability for everyone to publish, then women's stories um, about rape, about sexual abuse, they're gone. Yes. That's what editors used to keep out of the paper. That's True. what Harvey Weinstein was really good at just burying. So it's fantastic. You know, there's great strength, great weakness. You know, you got to live with the best and you take the worst from it, too. It's just that that's the world we live in. You know, it bears repeating, especially on a, a comic book centric podcast. Uh, and I've told this story before, and I don't know if you know it, Al Cap, you know, had a few uh, uh, Me Too moments with co-eds, and it came across, oh God, the uh, an old Washington uh, columnist who was a big star and, and, and very, Jack Anderson. Okay. And I'm really glad I remember the name. So it, and, and ironically, Britt Hume, currently at Fox News, was his leg man. Mm. And and literally, he got the story first and is like, uh, it looks like, you know, Al Cap of Little Abner fame is uh, abusing uh, women at colleges. And we really needed to make this story public. And Anderson is like, well, he's a celebrity. I'm sure there's two sides to every story. And it's like, Brit Hume is like, hey, I got four cases here of it happening. This is real. And did it, it come out? I don't even it know. It did. It, it did. did come and out. It, and great. it stopped Al Cap in his tracks. It was in the mid-70s. I know, we were kids. 
But it, yeah, that's when Lynn Labner suddenly was pulled from a bunch of newspapers and he really lost a lot. I mean, because he also, he's a fascinating character. And I say that at, with the evilness of him and also just his success as a, as a cartoonist because he really was as successful as Walt Disney, you know, before Walt Disney and everything. It really was a merchandising machine when it came to his characters and everything and really was also like the first cartoonist celebrity. It was mm -hmm. not wasn't shy like a Charles Schultz. I mean, was very proud of it, and then also had this weird political shift, starting off as very much a liberal, and then the hippies turned him off. So then he yeah, became he very conservative. The other way. Yeah, in the sixties and seventies, and he would go to colleges. There's a great YouTube video of one of the albums of him appearing at a university and challenging the liberals to mm. open debate, and they're fascinating to hear. But then yeah. again, yeah, so I didn't know is, any. I hadn't. I didn't know anything about him actually, except for just the just the art. I have so a hard yeah. time though. You kind of ruin it for me though, because I, I have a oh, very sorry. hard time separating the art from the artist. I, I you know, people are like oh, separate. I'm like, I can't separate it. Once you become, you know, a dirt bag, the art gets it's ruined hard. for me. No, I agree. It's hard. And again, it, uh, Dennis Kitchen co-wrote this incredible biography of uh, of him, and it's, it's okay. amazing. So yeah, I, I absolutely recommend it, and I've talked to Kitchen about it as well. And yeah, and I, and it was just such a weird little side note. Oh, and by the way, thank Brit Hume for kind of Brit like Hume of all people. Who knew? Now who knew? Exactly, man. So yeah, I, I, the, and that's why I bring it. It's it's amazing. Well, this is all right. This is a from a, from a we we went from really difficult to semi difficult, and now we're into comics, and now we can have fun. Yes, yeah. yes, let's do it. <laughs> So, You're always going to come back to comics, you know that. Got, no, Brad, I always love it. I'm always happy. I want you to promote your new books, but it's always good to have a nice nerd conversation with you. Let me ask you one thing, because I've always, I always want to like grab kernels of your your writing comics. And right now, we're at a really interesting point because DC uh, is a bunch of uh, runs are winding down, and they're going to be handed off to new people and some of the big toys. And you found yourself. I mean, Green Harrow wasn't the biggest toy, but it was coming off the Kevin Smith, you know, run. And um, we've talked a bit about it before. Um, were there other people beyond Shrek that you talked to, your editor? And, I mean, this was a, I mean, really, it's a job that a lot of people, they don't want to follow a big name. They, yeah, you know, no, listen, when I, took over, when I took over Green Arrow, it was the number one superhero book DC had. It was the number one book. Why? Because it's Kevin. I mean, God bless Kevin Smith. Who was like, I'm returning this to the greatness that Green Arrow is. He plunked down his name, and the book went with it. Um, and so it was the, I know it sounds silly to say Green Arrow was the number one book. It was the number one book. And uh, all credit to him. When I came on, I remember Shrek said to me, if we take anyone else in our publishing stable and put them on our number one book, everyone's going to bitch and say, where's Kevin Smith? We want the director. But they said, if you would put you in, no one knows who you are. You write novels, but no one knows you in comics. And it, the people are going to say, if DC's taking their number one superhero book and putting a novelist on it, then they must know something we don't know. And he said to me, I'm going to warn you, you're going to either succeed on a big stage or you're going to fail on a big stage. But you'll be on the big stage. And I, he said, I said, well, I'll take that shot any day. Um, but I, I have to give full credit to Kevin Smith because he released immediately a, when they announced me a press release. And, and they said, you know, I'm taking over in issue 16. And Kevin wrote this thing that said, like, you know, I read it already. It's going to be great. I'm going to be there. I can't wait. And I don't know whether he read it or not. I don't even know if I was even done with it at that point. But he was nice enough, sight on scene, to say, I'm sticking around for issue 16. I hope you will, too. And that is the mark of class. And I've thanked him to his face. I, I You know, I love Kevin. But I can never repay that kindness. That was so nice of him to do that. And when you, and anyone, I mean, I remember when, when Scott Snyder was writing Batman and then this guy, Tom King was coming and obviously I'm friends with both of them, but everyone going like, who wants to follow Scott? You know, and now you have, what's his name? Uh, you know, James, James. following, uh, yeah, following Titan. Tom. Yeah. And you know, that's what comics is. Someone eventually is going to write Titans after Marv Wolfman. Like it's just the way it's going to be. And uh, I, I'm a firm believer in take the big stage. At least you get a shot. And, and how uh, big was, I mean, because certainly social media wasn't where it was now. Certainly not. And even, I don't even know. If it was MySpace. bulletin boards. It, you know what? It was yeah, MySpace. Was about, yeah. it, was, it was bulletin boards. It was like Jinx World was there. I remember being on Ben's sure. side. <laughs> and there was, and DC had the message boards. That was how you got stuff. I remember you used to go back 
and you'd go on, it was, you know, and I was someone who used to be on bulletin boards when I was younger. So I actually thought it was pretty normal. Sure. It's like the geekiest, best place, but that's, you would, you would still, you'd still know. And you could see the simmering rage that still lurks online when it comes to our wonderful uh, universe. I mean, cause there is just that simmering rage that is always there. It used to just be in comic stores and then it was in bulletin boards and then it was on Jinx World. And now it's just on, it's called Twitter. Um, but that's the way it is. And, and that's the way it's always going to be now, sadly. Yeah. Did it bum you out? Did it, did it, uh, you know, we got I, lucky. I, your reaction? Yeah. We, we were very lucky. I think we were, it was all about expectations. We got, we did really well on green arrow. People were like, wow. And, and the book did not dump down, which was amazing because they thought it was just going to slide. Sure. Um, we, of course, and it was the same thing in publishing when, when the first book I ever wrote came out, we got these stellar reviews in, at Vanity Fair and Entertainment Weekly. I mean, in uh, sorry, in uh, USA Today and Time Magazine and everything. Okay. And then it hit the bestseller list. I remember turning to my wife when, when we hit the bestseller list in week one, and I turned to my wife and I said, let the backlash begin. And the week later, after everyone gave us these stunning reviews, Entertainment Weekly gave me a D plus. Wow. A D. I mean, we had like rave reviews that it was like the next coming and then it was a D plus in the same week. I was like, really? Um, and again, not that the A's mean you're great and not that the D pluses mean you suck, but it was just, that's the way it goes. So for Green Arrow, again, expectations are low. Everyone's like, this was great. Oh my gosh, it didn't suck. Um, when we did Identity Crisis, again, that's where we started to see it. Like once, once you say we're doing the big thing, get ready, um, get ready. Because this is the, you know, and, and I'm guilty of it too. The moment any comic book company, publisher, movie company, or anyone says to me, here's the next big thing. I'm like, I'll tell you what the next big thing is. You know, <laughs> like, do not tell me what the next big thing is. And sure. it's just human nature. Like the moment we, you tell me it's going to be great, I'm, I'm rooting against it before we've even started. So uh, it's just, the, that's the way the culture is. And, uh, but I do think it's, listen, it's hard. It's hard when, I mean, there are bigger problems in life and bigger problems in the world right now, but but to take over for someone who's been on these books and doing these things, it definitely becomes a, uh, it can be a, a crazy uh, awakening, especially as someone who I write my novels. I sit alone for two years and come out with a book and no one's writing to me after chapter one, like, oh my gosh, I got the ending. Like you got to read the end of the book to get the ending. But you, you know, we had, I remember the day we came out with identity crisis. Number one, there were 5 billion guesses on the internet. At that point, the internet was in full swing and one person because they guessed everyone. It was like someone had a who's who open. They were just going through and just guessing everyone. But someone did guess the ending. They got it. And I remember being like, that one person's right. Everyone else is wrong, but someone will guess it no matter what. That's awesome, man. Well, you know, I, I'm i going to ask you, Brad. I, uh, Identity Crisis is another, I think, story that in uh, you know its subsequent years uh, has been recontextualized uh, and, and, and in, some, in some arenas. And uh, yeah, how do you feel? How do you feel about? Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, I have to. I I look at it. I mean, I do think, and I, it's funny. I was at uh, Tom King and I were sitting down, and I said to him, we were talking about because he was doing Heroes in Crisis, and I was talking about Identity Crisis. We were talking about it again, and I said, I don't think DC would let me do that story today. I think the rape scene becomes obviously something very different. I also firmly believe. Um, that you know, if you look back at what I said when Identity Crisis came out, and people said, you know, how can you deal with rape in a comic book? Right. Uh, the one thing I said back then, and I still stand behind, is um, I wish rape didn't exist in our culture. Um, we're in this medium that drops buildings on people and and murders and slaughters people, you know, without any care. Um, but to say that uh, our medium can't deal with an issue is completely limiting of the medium. It, it's a real issue and needs to be dealt with. And I know now, of course, we see it as like, you know, more of the, the face front way we should see it, but we have to tackle those issues. Um, I just don't know if we, if they would let us do it. And, and, and of course I realize the recontextualization of it. It, it certainly has changed. Um, so I don't, you know, again, it's, you write these things in time um, and, and where you are in time. And, at that point, I felt like you know no one was talking about rape, or it was just kind of like a throwaway. We made it obviously a, a key part of the story, and yeah. made it affect this character, and made it have a, a, a long-lasting effect on her, and tried to give it all the the genuine attention that it should get if you're going to use it in a story. 
Um, but that said, as you said, the world changed around it. Understood, man. Yeah. And I um, no, it's 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 one of the great tragedies in the DC universe. And it's, you know, again, with with reboots, uh, things get wiped away. But uh, I, I think it I think, again, as a middle aged white guy, I understood the emotional cord. And I'm, well, let, you know, I, I thought for sure. I remember at the time someone said, you know, Sue Dibney is going to be dead for a couple of years and then they'll bring her back. And I was like, and again, it's not up for me to decide or not, or maybe she will, or maybe she won't, or whatever it was. But the fact that we're, you know, we're almost at the 20 year mark um, is wow. crazy to me. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't know if that was, you know, why that is or what it is, or maybe not, or, and not that that's the measure of it really anything, but it is kind of fascinating to me um, how quickly we play that revolving door. And, and, and I still say at book signings, every event, in fact, even now, for, even for the books I'm going to do this week, I will get, I can't tell you how many people still bring or send or they order from books and books when we do autograph the copies. Um, Identity Crisis is still the number one thing I sign. So the wow. number one thing people bring me, um, the reprints, you know, we've done, uh, we did a 10 year anniversary. We did the, you know, we did a five year anniversary, a 10 year anniversary. I mean, there, it's, it's, I, I, I can't possibly even believe that people are still reading the story. And, and I will say regularly on Twitter, Facebook, and everywhere else, there's someone who's finding it new today. And, and, I, and I love that about comics is that somewhere out there, there's someone who's reading it for the very first time, even though it's a book that, you know, is now, I think it was in 19, when, when did we do that book? 2005, four, three, something like that. Yeah, I think four. 2004. Five, yeah. yeah, I think yeah. it was 2004. Yeah. No, I remember. Like I said, Brad, it was right around when I started War Balloon. It was an amazing book. It's interesting. I have, uh, I was, and, I, and I'm sure you're doing it too, and I'm interested to see what you've been reading. Since COVID, I, um, I really did reach back for some old books, and I read a lot of your Justice League and the stuff that you did with... Um, with Jeff, with the Justice League and the Legion. And those oh, yeah, stories. that was a fun, yeah, we had fun yeah. with that book. Yeah, Jeff, I mean, listen, Jeff and I see things amazingly alike when it comes to that, and it was, um, but, you know, we were, chill again, that was like 2005, 2006, and we were kids just excited to have the good toys, um, but I love those stories. I mean, I love all that art. I love, you know, the artists we work with, and I loved, I remember back at the time, you know, when we started that, Green Lantern was dead, Hal Jordan was dead, and Flash was dead, and Barry was dead, and we were like, I remember sitting with Dan DiDio, and uh, and Jeff was, you know, he said to me, you know, we're going to bring back, you're going to do this, and Jeff, you're going to bring back Hal Jordan, and don't say anything, and then Barry Allen's going to come back, and we were just like, oh my God, it's happening. Now I know it's easy to bring someone back, but it was, I mean, I, in fact, I spoke to Dan, who I love and adore, um, a couple, maybe about, about a month ago, and we just had this conversation, we were talking about those times, and I sh had no business doing Justice League. I was busy doing a novel. I was working on stuff. And then friggin' Dan DiDio came to me and he knew my weakness and said, I'm going to give you, if you want, I'll give you Justice League number one. You pick anyone you want on it, whoever you want. And I was like, anyone I want, like anyone you want. And I was like, curse you, mother effer. I'm like, he knew that I couldn't say no to that. I would never say no to that. And I have no regrets of it either. Um, but for me, it's funny just to go back to what you're saying. I've definitely also gone on the Wayback Machine. So my yeah. son last night, and I, I emailed him yesterday, um, is reading the Judas contract. He read it last night Great. and I emailed Marv uh, Wolfman and with a picture of my son. And I said, I just want you to know you now have two generations of Meltzers who are reading your work um, and inspired by it. But even my son who had no, he knew terror was a traitor. He'd seen the cartoons. It's on the cartoons. Yes. But when he gets to the end and he sees what happens to her, he's like, Oh crap. I'm like, you didn't know that part. Did you? And he's like, I did not. And, He's a little kid and he was just blown away by it. And I just love the fact that that old story that's, you know, over 35, 35 years, yeah, yeah, 35 uh, years ago, yeah, yeah, is still as potent. I think it's still amazing. And much like what you were saying about identity crisis, there are, op there are aspects of the Judas contract. And in fact, I had Marv on a panel. I'm like, there's no way DC would let you do yeah, no, 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 I agree. some of that stuff. A hundred percent. Right, and you can't have the older guy sleeping with. I mean, she's like, well, how was she? Six, like 15? fifteen or sixteen? Yeah, yeah no, man. that's that's you know, like, and again, it's it it is that is the story. Why well, you know, there's a there's an, an incredible rape scene, you know, that is brutal, incredibly brutal rape scene in Watchmen, um, that you're like, you know, that is vital to the story. You know, it is the yes. big part of the story. Which yes. Um, and, but I, I, again, to go back, I don't think you go back and say anything that makes us uncomfortable, we have to redo. Um, 
you got to give it the context and give it the attention it deserves and deal with it in a, in a way that you feel like does justice to that issue that you're trying to point to. Um, and, and you do your best to that. And, and, and that is the one thing I think you always have to do. Yeah. I could not agree more. Um, are you, are you pressed for time? I'll wrap up if you need to. No, I can go. Let's see what I got. I got, I got, yeah, I can go until five. Okay, great. Excellent, man. Um, what do you, again, you we're, we're going through a very interesting time in comics because I do think, unfortunately, because of the circumstances, the direct market is definitely changing. And without really talking to any of the people at, at on top at DC and Marvel, you can just see the signs that maybe the monthly magazine is an endangered species for the big two because it really does seem like they are transitioning to digital first, then a trade paperback. And I don't know how much of that is impacting uh, the traditional, well, certainly not the digital first, but I, you know, and, and the book world seems to be running along. Can you com can you comment on both? The, the yeah, I mean, listen, I'm actually fascinated because I come from the world of novels. You get a book and you people pay for it and then they have the full story. I mean, I wrote Identity Crisis, all seven issues before the first one was even handed in. I was like, here, I'm done. I wrote it like a novel. Um, and that was how I knew how to do things. And then I was like, oh, you're gonna, you're gonna do, I knew obviously it was gonna be monthly, but I'm like, I, I'm still shocked to this day how much money people will pay and buy those floppies and then go and buy the trade. And I should know, I mean, cause I'm certainly one of those same customers, but that's just no, you can say whatever you want that they're steering away, they're doing this or doing that. They're not trying to do anything. The reader has the power. If you stop buying floppies, they're going to stop doing them. But I guarantee you, as long as they can sell, you know, there's a, there's a price point where it makes it worthwhile to print it. And as long as they can make money doing it and still make money on, on the, the book side, they're going to take both. But I do think it's fascinating that one of the few growth, uh, you know, in publishing nonfiction uh, was down, fiction was actually up. You know, they go plus and minus in COVID and where they go. But sure. the thing that is still showing spectacular growth and, and spectacular growth last year, the biggest growth, in fact, of I think any genre was was what they call graphic novels, what you and I, of course, call comic books, was comics. Yeah. The comic book section, people are reading them where, you know, it, it, that is just the way it goes. And, and to me, that's a good thing. I think I actually think what the what the big two are fighting for um, is just trying to find more talent. Because at the end of the day, it used to be you came through the big two and that's how you got your name to do your own independent book, right? You like... You, you worked on the big two and then you became Neil Gaiman and then you took off. You became Garth Ennis and you took off. You became whoever it was and then you could go do your thing. And you don't need that anymore. You can go to Image and do your own book and you can do really well. And there are people who break in now through Image doing their own book and then have a run and then go do their own thing. I mean, so I actually think it's just, um, it, it is harder to just find. And, you know, if, you, if, if writers and artists don't need you, um, they have problems like then then it's harder to find and bring new names in because eventually the comic book industry has one story that it tells over and over and you know what it is there's going to be a creator he's going to come work for your company they're going to spit you out it's the saddest story but it's the origin story of comics no one wants to say it out loud but from jerry siegel and joe schuster that's been the story and sometimes you leave on your own and sometimes you don't get the choice and it happens to all of us um, and until you can figure that out, uh, you know, people don't want to put their heads in the wood chipper. But unlike Siegel and Schuster, who tried with Funny Man to walk away from Superman and do something else, I do think the environment, as you just said, is better. And, uh, and, and it's not the only way, as you said as well, because Renee Telgemeier doesn't need to work for Marvel. Right. The number one comic in the whole country, the number one book in all the country is Raina crushing it. Like, you tell me you go read those books. I mean, I buy them for myself. I give them to my kids, but I buy them and read them myself. They're fantastic. Uh, every, they're all of them. I love all of them. And, and at the end of the day, as long as there's great talent like that, I'm in. Count me in. I don't care who publishes it. I love reading. You know, I love um, what Cammie's doing with Beast Boy and Raven. Her books are fantastic. They're great. She's found a way to kind of build in from one place and then come into D.C. And D.C.'s not stupid. They're like, We'll take her. She's got a great voice here. She's doing something different. And as long as that happens, then the industry moves forward. But don't, don't, I, I firmly, I'm not a naysayer on the industry. I think 
Um, oh, I'm not either. I, 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 the, I, you know, I talked to Jim, I talked to, you know, Joe, I, I, I love these guys. I know them for years and, um, everyone is working on something awesome. We, you know why? Cause the people who work on love this industry and they love these characters. And as long as that's the case, you'll get good stories. Well, I don't doubt that. Um, the one thing I do think is that we don't know what AT&T's plans are for DC. A hundred percent. That, and that is, that, listen, know. that firing was, was of course, you know, we lost great friends, Hank, you know, like amazing people that were there. Um, that we know that I, yeah, yeah, I mean, over and over, um, that will change things a hundred percent. Um, corporate is still corporate at the end of the day. But, uh, I will say, you know, that's every, you just described every company in America, you know, we're not that special. I mean, every company in America is basically going, Oh crap, who are we going to fire? Because the company isn't there the way it was. We just in Florida here lost 25,000 employees. Disney fired, um, 25,000. Yeah. That's a staggering number. Um, so every company is trying to figure out right now how we can do it. And, and I, I hate the fact that it's, you know, we saw so many people who love this industry had to leave it. Um, it's just where we are. It's sad. Agreed. And also, yeah, I mean, you point out Disney. That's the thing, because some people might be, well, Disney Plus and, you know, all the ABC channels that they own and all that. And it's like, yeah, and the Disney cruises that aren't happening and the parks that aren't happening. And that's the bread and butter. That's the engine. And it's like. No, I, and, and, and yeah, AT&T, you know, I, and I might have already even mentioned this to you before. Marty Pasco, 11 years ago, was telling me it's possible that we'll have a day where Disney and, and, and or Marvel and DC at the time will license their IPs oh, you're to see IDW that. or somebody else. And it's like, you'll see it. sure. Yeah, as you saw it, you see it. Yeah, and it's right. It's already happening with the kids' books, like the way Disney gives IDW the, the Star Wars kids books and the and Spider-Man books. books. They have Spider-Man yes. books. Yep. Absolutely, man. So yeah, I mean, that, but again, I don't believe in the death of comics. And the no, but the, like the, at the end of the day, you have to feed the machine, right? If you, if you don't have people yeah. coming in, new voices coming in and making change and making villains you don't like and seeing things new and rewriting and, and plowing over all the crap that came before it, then you have this old stagnating property that no one cares about. And you know which properties those are. They're the ones that have been left behind and nothing's happened to. And when they re pull them out, you feel like you're blowing a thing of dust off of them. I love the fact that there's, you know, and, and my friend Damon Lindelof did this great story. And I, you and I were talking about it. I don't forget if it was on air or off, but it, where he talked about, you know, people being mad when you redo things or recontextualize you. And then, you know, and, and I know they were giving JJ Abrams, uh, you know, and I love JJ, like giving him crap over his writing of Superman, but, and they shouldn't because why? Because you need new voices, you need new takes. And everyone's like, no, you don't. They're set in stone. And then Miles Morales comes and you're like, tell me that Miles Morales is not Spider-Man, right? There are people who will fight to the death rightfully that he is. And I love the fact that that's what, that's what's so great about our industry is that, it, you know, we, we, we will all be experts and all say we know everything until one person comes along with a new idea and blows all our bullshit out of the water and makes us realize we don't know crap because <laughs> there's always room for another good story. It's an excuse to let you know that we're, I'm uh, helping program Baltimore Comic-Con online with my friends at Mainframe Comic-Con, and we're conducting a lot of creator-to-creator -creator conversations, and one of those is between Jerry Conway and Brian Bendis. Oh, and, that's great. And, and yeah, man, from JLA Detroit and all those new characters that Conway introduced to Miles Morales to both of their takes on Superman and Spider-Man. I'm like, and it was so funny because the first time, oh yeah, I'll moderate that. And then I'm like, no, I won't. I'm going to get the hell out of the way and yeah, let these two no, guys just, just talk. Shut up and let them go. That yeah, would be so, great. I'll, I'll be watching that. There you go, man. And we're I giving, love them both. They're both good people. We got Tom uh, King and uh, Dave Gibbons talking to each other. As, and, that's a perfect and, one. And, uh, and uh, Vida Ayala is going to interview uh, Shelly Bond. About oh, that's her. great. That's great. Yeah. You know, honestly, and I, I, I have to say that I, I was kind of the guy putting this stuff together, and I'm like, these are going to be good, man. This is the kind of thing I want to Yeah, watch. don't get moderators. Let them talk. No. Nope. I mean, I nope. guess you can get someone to ask questions so they don't just whatever, but that's who I want to see talking. That's for sure. Yeah, man. No, that's great. Well, there you go. All right, we'll wrap up. Dude, as always, congratulations. Uh, yes, I, thank you. I am Ann Frank. I am Ben Franklin. Uh, those are the two next books. They are out as of today. As, as of today. And let me also say one thing that is so important. I'll leave you Please. with this. 
is a huge thank you to everyone out there in comics who supports these books. I, I see it every time. You know, they'll, you, so many of you come and you say, I don't even have kids, but I'm building this for my kids one day. Or I hate kids, but I'm buying these for myself <laughs> because I like the way you and Chris do them like comics. I friggin' love you guys. I love, love, love all of you who come and support us and buy books, you know, whether it's the fiction, the nonfiction, the thrillers, or these, um, but especially these. So consider buying an Anne Frank and giving it to your church, or your synagogue, or a school, or someone you don't know. Use it for Halloween, man. Give it to some kid who comes in the best costume. But I, I'm trying to get this message out there, and, and I thank you to the comic community for just really supporting and seeing, seeing this love we have of this medium. I'm glad you got the opportunity to write Green Arrow and it led to all of your comic book writing, Brad, because I don't know if we'd be talking if that wasn't the case. And I, you know, I, I love what you do with the kids' books. I love your uh, fiction and nonfiction and also uh, what you're doing uh, in comic books. So, no, it's always it's it's great. And I'm always happy as hell that you're willing to come back and bullshit with me. Well, thank you. And thanks for being so nice to our man, Chris Eliopoulos. He's actually the true star of the show. Indeed. Well, he yeah, he's doing the heavy lifting for your books, no question. No crap. That's you do not have to tell me. You do Absolutely. not have to tell me. Chris is the master. Absolutely. Dude, be well. And uh, great seeing you. And uh, yeah, we'll talk. I mean, whenever it's the next kids' book or uh, whatever uh, comes in comic or uh, novel form from Brad Meltzer, I'm waiting for our next conversation. Can't wait. There you go, man. Well done. Thank you so much for doing this, dude. As always, I love.